Alice and for Trust. Well, well, my next guest is someone who grew up in a tiny village in the north of England, a mining village, and they worked very hard there, they played very hard, and when they played, they played soccer football. This particular woman was uh, involved in a great soccer family. Her brothers and her uncles were great soccer stars, and she passed on that talent, that genius and the genes, to her own two sons. She was a lifelong supporter of England's international football squad until this year, when she found herself instead cheering for the Republic of Ireland. The reason has become obvious when I introduce you to her. Her name is Sissy Charlton. <laughs> Sissy, you're very welcome to Dublin. First time to Dublin? Yes, and I've had hundreds of people say that to me today, and I feel so welcome. Everybody said, welcome to Dublin. And that's lovely. That's lovely. Uh, you, you're in the presidential suite in the Burlington oh, Hotel. Oh, yes, we can play Tiggy up there. There's so much room. <laughs> <laughs> you're enjoying it, the style. Yes, yes. Well, yes. given that your son Jack was almost sanctified, if not beatified in this country, I think the least you deserve is the presidential suite. The least oh, you can I do. don't know. Uh, what about that, uh, the, the, the tug between your support for England all your life and suddenly in West Germany, um, Ireland are playing England? I mean, yes, I know. Uh, I would love to be in Germany. I would love to have gone. But, however, circumstances didn't allow it. So I sat watching it and I thought, well, Bobby Robson's a personal friend of mine. You know, Bobby used to come to our house in Ashington with Bobby when they played together for the England team. And I was di my loyalties were divided. But once I saw Jack sitting there, I thought, oh, no, come on, Ireland, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Now, we, we went out in a blaze of glory, but yeah. you watched the matches. What did you think of, of the goal that put us out? It was offside. <laughs> it was definitely offside. I thought, it can't be a goal. I was sat there by myself in my one-bedroom flat, and I thought, can't be a goal, it's impossible. Then he pointed to the middle and I thought, my God, it is a goal. R all wrong. Mm. It's wrong. Uh, football has been very much part of your life. Yes. I mean, brothers, uncles, your own sons. Yes. But what about your own life? Uh, tough life in a oh, mining yes, village. Oh, yes, the North East. I think, you know, the Ireland, we are on a par in the North East with Ireland. I don't know why, but I have that feeling that your people were the same as us. But it was a tough time, I mean... Oh, it was, yes. I went to London at 14 and to service, you know, and that was hard. I was homesick, terribly homesick. What did you make of life in London when you went as a, as a serving girl below <laughs> stairs at 14? I thought it was terrible. I must have been a socialist even in them days because <laughs> I thought it was awful. Fancy, because we haven't as much money as them. We've got to go and bow down to them. And that, I didn't like it. I hated every minute of it. And you, was it homesickness that brought you back? Oh, well, it was all sorts of things. I didn't like it. I didn't like working for people, you know. Not like that. Don't get me wrong. I've worked all my life. But, you know, I had to be up in the morning and they had a, a red tiled hallway, you see. And I had to wash that and then do it over with milk. And coming from the northeast, where we were so poor, which we were in them days, and they were putting milk on the floors to me was wrong. But there's nothing I could do about it. People without milk in the north of England and That's these people... That's right, and people putting it on the floors in the south. Mm. You had a, a couple of false starts in the romantic stakes before you met your late husband, <laughs> Bob Senior. Tell me how you met him. Well... I went to this dance, and we'd known each other a long time. You know, we went to school together, really, but uh, I wasn't interested in him. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, you've finished with your lad, and I've finished with my last, so will we have this dance? And it was uh, an old-time dance, and we said yes, and we've danced together ever since. <laughs> uh, he was into boxing, though, not soccer. Yes, he wasn't interested in football. Was, it, was he handy at it? Like our Lord Mayor here? Well, when we were courting, we went into this... They used to have boxing booths where I live, you know, every Friday night. 
And when you court and you go anywhere with the men, you know, with the lad, you think. <laughs> so anyway, I went and he went into the uh, ring. This man hadn't turned up, you see, and they asked for volunteer. And he went in and he won a pound. And we went up to a jeweller's and we got a wedding ring, 17 and 6. And I still wear it yet. Oh, isn't that lovely? And um, half a crown change bought with curb for the fireplace. And... That yeah. was a pound well spent, I that think. That was wasn't a it? pound well spent. What about the two lads? Jackie was your eldest. Yes. And uh, Bob came along. But uh, the, the footballing talent, was it obvious from the beginning? Bobby, it was, yes. But I, I didn't know about Jackie. He wasn't so keen as Bobby. You know, Bobby was football mad, you know, like his mother. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack was, I don't know, he liked to go fishing and. Bird nesting and outdoor sports, which he's still good at yet, you know. And what but would he have been? I mean, it, it seemed like a bolt from the blue when yes. Leeds came along uh, and signed him up as a, as a young fellow. Yes. What would he have been if he Well, he had, he had filled a form in for the police force and he was accepted as a cadet after he had said he would go to Leeds. Mm. Was there any prospect that he'd ever have gone back down the pits? Well, he didn't. He didn't want to, and he didn't like it, you know, but uh, he had... They came and asked him if he would go for a trial, and that was great. Mm. It kept him out of the pits. You're, you're a woman of, uh, I suppose, remarkable stamina, but your running uh, started at a very young age. You were, you were a bookies runner's runner. Yeah, my dad... <laughs> <laughs> yes, my dad was... Uh, you know how they used to stand on the corner ends and take bets from them days. There was no betting shops. Well, he was one of them. And if anybody brought a bet to the house, remember they used to put it in a little pail and I used to carry it up. Well, I thought you were going to the seaside, you see. Nobody bothered you. Your little bucket and spade? Yes. <laughs> was it illegal at the time? It was illegal, yes. Yes. The police used to run after them, you know, and if, mm. if they caught them, they were up at court, but... You never got caught. You were a bit of a tomboy, I take it. Yes, yes. I should have been a lad. (laughs) (laughs) If you had been, would you have been a footballer? I would have been an athlete of some sort. Yes. When you talk about, say, Jack as a a lad and not having the obvious talent, um, I mean, what does he feel about it? Reading in your book, for example, you know, uh, you, you write about Jack as sort of not terribly skilled in the game, you know, tough, though, Yes, and well, Jack forward. was always a worker, you know. When, you know, the uh, war had, you know, just started and uh, we were really struggling, you know. Mm. The pits were working three days a week and he used to take papers out and take a, a grocery around. He always brought his money home and it was a good help. He's always been a hard-working lad ever since he was a little boy. Mm. I'm, I'm kind of glad you said that, because, as it happens, our next guest standing behind there is Mr Jack Charlton. <laughs> well, Jack, you're, you're very welcome. What do you think of the mum's book? Oh, well, I read half of it, um, <laughs> mainly because I haven't been home very much and I've been travelling quite a lot this last uh, couple of weeks since I got a copy of it. I've only just got a copy. I mean, she had done the book before I, and I, I didn't even know she had done it. Never said anything. And then to... when the publisher phoned me and said he would like me to do some of the promotions on it, I said, no, I haven't read it. She hasn't done a book. And then she sent me a transcript to have a look at it there. It was a bit late. Yeah, well, what you said to us when we rang you up asking you to come over and, and sort of join your mother on the panel, you says, she can plug her own bloody book. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard her, she's quite well capable of that. I mean, no problem. Yeah. Uh, Jack, the, the whole business of football, I mean, was it almost accidental that you became the footballer? No, I always, you know, they, I, I, I enjoyed playing football and we always played a lot. I mean, me and, our, me and our kid played hours and hours with a little tennis ball heading back and forth against the, the toilet doors. You know, we, we live, yeah. the toilets are down the bottom of the road. And, the, and, and we, we played a lot. We, we played on a Sunday. The only thing was that uh, when we went to play, if there was, the, like the game started on a Sunday morning and finished on a Sunday night on the <laughs> local park. And uh, 
And if me and our kid went down to the field, like, to get a game, they would give him a game and I would have standing on the touchline all the time because he could play. Yeah. I, mean, I could never play. You described uh, Bobby's little Lord Fauntleroy. Yes, I did. He was always so clean and tidy. Jack was always so <laughs> scruffy and <laughs> always his ragged pants oh, pulling no, in his knees out. Be fair, he was, he was a mother's <laughs> boy, Archie. He wasn't. He <laughs> wasn't, it's not true. <laughs> I, do, I just think it's the way you, you are. I mean, I'm, I've always been a pretty independent sort of person. And like, like she says, I'm not a hard worker, but I've always been a good earner. Yes, that's and there's a difference true. between working hard and being a good earner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, w w when you were with Leeds, I mean, how would you characterise your style in those days? Well, like I said, I start to say, I, uh, people make comparisons between me and our kid, and it's, it's not fair. I mean, I, would never, I could never play like Bobby Charlie. He's one of the greatest players the world's ever produced. I mean, tremendous gifted player. Um, my type of game was different. I mean, Bobby could play, I couldn't, but I was bloody good at stopping other people playing. <laughs> Which is as much a part of the game, actually, as actually being able to play. As long as you've got the sense when you win the ball to give it to somebody who can play. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what Bobby was, he was a player. Sissy, what about your proud moments? I mean, the two lads, the first time they were ever on the same uh, international side together. Yeah, well, the proudest moment was when they both came out of the tunnel at Wembley together. Then Jack had reached Bobby's peak, you see. They were both England players. You can't get higher than that, can you? No, and I, that's that true. was proud to think I had two walking out of the tunnel at Wembley. They made a goal or two together? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yes. What, what about the World Cup, though? Oh, that 1966. Was fabulous. Legendary period. Fabulous, that. Yeah. Your, your late father, Bob Sr., um, he, he was dragged along, more or less, wasn't he? <laughs> he didn't want to go. <laughs> And he had a new, new bib and tucker for the occasion. Yeah. Yes, well, yes. It, meant, it meant him take the day off the pit, and he was yeah. very loath to do that. Yeah. You know, you'd, it, it would have cost him a few quid. And, uh, and, and, and he didn't actually come to the semi-final against Portugal. He was down the pit, and they had to go and fetch him up to look at the, the game in the manager's office. <laughs> you know, and he sat and watched it in the manager's office. He came to the final and loved it. Yes. You know, because he... With him not coming very much, he, always, he, he used to come to what, the, um, the hotels... <laughs> and and he, he's, he's a typical pitman. You ask him what he wants for dinner, and he could be in the Savoy anywhere. And he'd say, I want out of a bowl of soup and some fish. <laughs> some fish and some pudding. And that, and that, that was it. And we could have the best menu in the world, it didn't matter. Out of a bowl of soup, some pudding, and some fish. Um, it wasn't, I suppose, no life is, is without its, its share of tragedies and traumas. Now, the, the, the Munich air crash with yeah. Manchester United, when Bobby was with Manchester United. How did you react to the news? He might have been dead. Yes, well, the papers, you know, some of them kept saying there was no survivors. But the police came and they said, don't you believe anything, we'll keep you informed. And they did. And then uh, the lad on the, in the post office came to tell us that it was going on the placards, you see, and he wanted us to know. I didn't know anything about it up to This then. is the newspaper placards yes, with the headlines yes. saying... Same Manchester Air yes, Disaster. Yes, And uh, this policeman came and he waved a letter, you know, and it was from the Foreign Office to say that Bobby was all right. How did you hear about Jack? Uh, Jack? I was, uh, I was, we had just finished training and I was in the dressing room. I was, I was naked, I was standing, drying myself, I was just getting out of the bath. And the secretary, an old fellow called Arthur Crowther, of Legion at the time, came in and he just put his head in through the door and looked round at all the team and he went, uh, there's been... A crash. Manchester United aeroplanes crashed, and he said they don't know if there's any survivors. And then he walked out, and and all the lads turned and looked at me, and I was stood there and I went, and then Billy, uh, one of the lads, I forget which one it was, said, "Your kids on that with Ebony," and I went, "Yeah," and Arthur didn't even say anything, so I went flying at the office. And when I got in the office, I, I said they couldn't find out anything, and. So I, I went and phoned a wife, got on the plane, on the train, and went headed home, dashing. And, uh, and when I got off the, in Newcastle, I got a, a, a train, I got a, a taxi to the Haymarket, where you catch the bus to Washington. Because we didn't have cars in those days. And, uh, and as I'm walking past a, 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 a newspaper lad, he was stood about where that camera's away from us, and he had a papers over it. And I don't know how in the world I ever saw it, but along the, the stop press piece at the bottom, 
It said among the survivors, Bobby Chong, and I read it from about six yards away. And how I read it, I don't know, but I went and bought a paper and I went to pat my wife. I said, our kid's all right. And then, you know. That's the jig. Yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a terrible thing, because, I mean, they were all my age, all the lads. I mean, Eddie Coleman, Tom, Billy Whelan and uh, Tommy Taylor. There was, about, there was three of them at my wedding three weeks before. Yeah. You know, three of the lads that were killed in the crash. It took Bobby a while to get over it, too. Oh, a hell of a long time. Yeah. You, you wrote that when he looked at the football, he used to sometimes see the face of one of his dead mates. That's right. When they played at Wembley, you know, they went to Wembley that year, and uh, he said to Mrs. Pegg before the game, uh, every goal I score today is for David. Well, he didn't score any. And when he came off, he said, every time I kicked the ball, I could see the lad's faces. You know, and he said, sorry, I didn't get a goal for David. Mm. It was a great shadow over the yes, whole world of, yes, of, of soccer for a long, long yes, time. Mm. You had your own personal difficulties. I mean, there's a special nickname that Jack had for you, which you've written about <laughs> in the book. <laughs> lefty. <laughs> why, did, why, why does he call you Lefty? Well, I'll tell him. I do. <laughs> They've guessed already. <laughs> I she don't had, think they she have. Had, she had a breast off and she had a, 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 a lump in it and it took a breast away when, when, oh, long in it, many oh. years ago. 1955. And then she had this, this thing put in and it was always drooping lower than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they were first done, they were sort of made a bird seed. <laughs> no, they were sort of a bird seed. This was years ago. And... Uh, I used to dance a lot, you see, and when we did the Pride of Aaron, you know, where you go together, they used to start off, you know, <laughs> <laughs> turn around and look. It's so amusing. <laughs> but then we, we had a great sense of humour in our family, you know. We never, we never sort of dwelled on anything. And he used to keep calling us lefty. And people kept saying, what's he calling you lefty for? And I couldn't tell him. <laughs> you told the world now in, in the book. <laughs> you, yes, yes. You know, your sense of humour <coughs> seems to have got you through everything and, and kept yeah. you young. Now, you're still very physically active. Yes, yes. You're actually teaching football. Yes. How did that come about? Oh, well, after my husband died, we went into Jackie's house in the Dales, you know, we retired there and we were so happy there. It was beautiful. But he died, and I couldn't stay there because I didn't drive, and we were a mile off the road. So I, just, I stayed a while, and I just couldn't manage. So I came home to Ashington. He's got a little flat in Ashington. And um, mind, I'd, I've never regretted it because people have welcomed us back with open arms, literally, you know. And uh, when I got back, uh, this... I had to go to the hospital, voluntary work, you know, and I just didn't like that. And then the school teacher at the school, she says, why don't you come and help me? She says, we need help at the school. So I said, oh, I'd love that, because I love kids. And uh, I went. And, of course, there were all eight-year-olds, laddies and lassies, you know, and one said, you're Bobby Charlton's mother, aren't you, and Jackie's mother? I said, yes. Will you teach us how to play football? I said, I'd love to. Well, so, we actually have a have clip you? of you in action have teaching you? the kids in that school how to play football. And now you know where Jack gets it. <laughs> Take your places properly. One on the wing, one on each wing, three in the middle. And you'll come in the forward line. Right. Now, I want two back. Two to be back there. And I want three half back here. Don't stand dreaming, Neil. <laughs> right now. Go. Out. Out. What do you think of the team coach? Fantastic! <laughs> oh, that's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> well... All of us envy your energy and also your skills. I mean, if you were a lad, as you say, you would have been a great footballer. Yes. Yeah. Being Jack, my life's been born a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, the last thing we have to ask you, of course, prospects for the World Cup. Um, how do you feel about Ireland's chances? It's a bigger arena now. Well, it was it, it, the, the, uh, the award-winning thing I, I mentioned that uh, 
it was nice. It was nice that the people of Ireland were, were surprised when we lost the game, and they used to be surprised when we won one. You know, yeah. and uh, we lost in Spain, but it was we were a bit under strength on that day. I've always said if 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 all the lads turn up, we've got a lot of good players, and we'll qualify for Europe. we'll qualify for the next World Cup, and we just hope so. Great stuff. Well, that's Jack Charlton and the real boss, Sissy Charlton. Um, we have. We've had a bid for £2,000 and that was already super